Good morning. Everybody hear me okay? Can we back there? Great. We're good? All right. All right, I'm happy to be here, happy to talk to uh, all of you, and it's a great, uh, great crowd here. Um, I'm going to try to explain sort of Arkansas's position uh, uh, in, in the war and in, in a general way. Uh, we have several people that are speaking um, uh, in much more detail, and um, my, my talk is really an overview. So I hope you um, bear with me on that. <clears throat> First thing I want to say is that uh, this war was met with overwhelming exuberance. Uh, one Arkansas soldier, his name was Thomas Gibson from Judsonia, wrote, in, uh, uh, wrote home in August of 1917, and he perhaps demonstrates America's uh, feeling of confidence about the war. He told his mother, one of my friends told me that the war would not last long. I asked him why, and he said that his brother joined the army and that he has never had a job for more than two months. So the war would be over in two months, according to Thomas Gibson. And it was that sort of lighthearted exuberance of the war that was such a contrast to the reality of the war. And uh, that is something that I think we often, uh, we often forget. Uh, you know, we go back in the past <clears throat> and we say we go to a foreign country. And I think that's something that uh, World War I teaches us. <clears throat> American experience in the First World War was really a contrast to Europe's experience in the war. Uh, it's commonplace assertion that the Great War was the turning point of the modern world. Up until the 1914, the arc of history, uh, you might say, particularly Western history, was bent towards progress. But after the war, the world seemed broken. Um, it's as, as if all of its faults, its failings, were suddenly flung out in the public square for inspection and derision. Noted military historian John Keegan said that the First World War destroyed the benevolent and optimistic culture of the European continent. And I think that can't be overstated. One might say of all the Western culture, uh, uh, all of Western culture uh, was the same result as well. Certainly fascism, socialism took root during these wars. Certainly they brought to Europe a cultural rot, a sort of intellectual gangrene that required an excision so massive that it left behind a quadriplegic. Great War crushed the dreams of the progressives whose advocates believed that they were just on the cusp of a new social utopia. The social gospel, too, was banished from intellectual circles as a silly thought exercise. The progressives wanted to make a heaven here on earth. They wanted to usher in a time of peace and plenty which would hail the arrival of Christ's reign after the millennia. One such advocate of the social gospel, his name is Washington Gladden, wrote in his bestseller, Christianity and Socialism, 1905, international wars are less common than they once were. Their methods and implements have become so destructive that rulers shrink appalled from venturing upon them and making war impossible. And that will hasten the day of universal arbitration. It was a bestseller in 1905. This praying wing of the progressives believed that with religious fervor in a coming era of human perfection through a combination of socialism and Christianity. Of course, in 1914, this interpret of the age was in doubt. The post-war fallout completely cast aside social gospel uh, ideas completely. This utopia was envisioned in the United States uh, in President Wilson, who embarked upon this plan of the war to end all wars, was really a fiasco. One illustration makes this point clear. On 18 September 1922, Adolf Hitler, who was a demobilized front fighter who had fought in the war for Germany, threw down a challenge to his defeated Germany. And he said this, it cannot be that two million Germans should have fallen in vain. No, we do not pardon. We demand vengeance. And that desire for revenge, that desire of hate, festered until, in a feverish fit, the whole continent was swallowed up in yet another war. And so the Second World War often overshadows the First World War. And uh, we were just talking about this. People know a lot about the Second World War. Very little about the first. English poet Herbert Reed 
looking back on this, this whole bloody uh, period of war, said, happy are those who can relieve suffering with prayer. Happy those who can rely on God to see them through. They can wait patiently for the end. But we who have put our faith in the goodness of man and now see man's image debased lower than a wolf or the hog, where can we turn for consolation? Hitler's vengeance was a child of the Great War. It was a child of its technological uh, advances, its new death machines. It made Hitler's revenge easier. Each innovation of the Great War had its counterparts in all wars which came after. Machine guns, tanks, combat aircraft, mobile radio, submarines, chemical warfare, flamethrowers, mortars, and so on. The Great War was the first proving ground of just how far Western science and industry had truly come, and perhaps had sunk. John, T John Keegan again says simply that the First World War inaugurated the manufacture of mass death. The second brought that to a pitiless consummation. So here we have mass death. We're very familiar with the Holocaust, but we sometimes forget what Verdun and Somme were. And you'd be hard pressed looking at these photos to figure out which was which. There's little difference in the inhuman piling up of bodies at the Somme as at Dachau. They both seem to our modern eyes simply war crimes. So I think there's little need to discuss the impact of the war has had on us. We students of history here know in this gathering, we understand the importance of the war. But the greater question today really that we want to look at, is what was the impact in Arkansas and on her people? Most obviously when we speak of this war, we're interested in the deadly nature of it. It's a war after all. So straight away we ask the simple questions. How many Arkansans died? How many were injured in the fighting? Those are some important stats to lay out here. Nationally, during the wars 1917 to 1918, there were 116,516 deaths. That was about 0.1% of the population at the time, an average of 279 deaths each day. Actual combat deaths, rather from disease or accident or natural causes, was much lower, approximately 50,000. A total of 236,000 men were wounded, five out of six of those that were wounded were returned to duty. So there's some basic numbers. Those are not shockingly high numbers, especially if one considers that 40,000 of that 116,000 men died of pneumonia. Keep in mind here the dreadful disease of Spanish flu killed 75 million worldwide, 75 million worldwide over a period of about four years. This is at Ebert's Field in Lone Oak. And uh, this was a common case throughout Arkansas during the war. It wasn't the trench fighter. It wasn't the, the trenches and the machine guns that laid waste to Arkansas's fighting men. It was just a microbe. 7,000 died from pneumonia. Combat casualties, much, much less. Um, about 1,750 um, total. By comparison, 60,000 Arkansans served during the Civil War. The state counted some 10,000 dead. Of course, those figures belay the great importance and in difference in population between 1860 and 1920. In fact, only 4% of the state population of 1.75 million fought in the First World War. During the, during the Civil War, the population was 325,000, and so some 20%. 20% of Arkansas's population fought in the Civil War. So even during the time of the, of the Great War, the Civil War was the big shadow uh, that was being cast on this whole conflict. And that's part of what I want to talk about today. America entered the war, World War I late, three years late. Its army was small. It required many months to equip it and train it and, and get its divisions online and send them overseas. By the time they reached Europe, most of the European combatants were pretty much devastated. They had lost most of their fighting men, and really America's presence was uh, um, not as, as consequential as we sometimes like to think. Our army was inexperienced. It was full of draftees and newly minted officers. In fact, one of the first officers in combat was an Arkansan, and he had been trained at Fort Roots in 1917. He'd only been 
in a military year. Same can be said of Arkansas in the South. When the war came to America in 1917, the war that loomed large in uh, the average Arkansan mind was the Civil War. Uh, it was the Southern view. This was the images uh, that were in the mind of the Arkansan during those days, not the war in Europe. Uh, Confederate veterans were uh, the, the white-headed, bearded, old veterans that people knew in those days. Uh, today, if a World War II veteran visits, we all um, you know, are, are sort of uh, uh, deal with them in deference. Um, and that is exactly how the Confederate veteran was, was taught. And so there's some pieces here to understand about that, that, that era for Arkansas. In 1911, Little Rock had 100,000 uh, Confederate veterans in attendance for the Confederate reunion, veteran reunion. Uh, that was twice the size of the city. We had more Confederate veterans in Little Rock than there were people in 1911. 1913 was really the beginning of sheathing the sabers of the Civil War. This was a 50th anniversary of, the, of Gettysburg. Some 50,000 gray-bearded veterans gathered in Gettysburg on Ju over July 4th weekend. It's been the largest Civil War reunion for guys on both sides um, up to that time. Parades, marching, singing, fireworks, shooting matches. There was even a movie made of this reunion. And of course, President Wilson spoke on July 4th uh, at Gettysburg. This is what he said. We have found one another again as brothers and comrades in arms. Enemies no longer, perhaps generous friends, rather our battles long past, the quarrel forgotten, except we shall not forget the splendid valor. If you were a youngster heading off to war in 1917, your view of war was stuck in the 19th century. This is the camps and the veterans that you understood. <clears throat> there was a spirit of camaraderie uh, and, and uh, a flurry of monument building across the South uh, propelled principally by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, which had formed in 1896. By the, by the time of World War I, it had some 100,000 members. Many monuments to the Confederacy were built during the World War I era. Uh, 36 Confederate monuments in Arkansas mostly dated to this 50, 50th anniversary period. In addition to the UDC, Arkansas purchased what is now the Prairie Grove Battlefield in 1917. You see the connection here? between the Great War and the Civil War and what's going on. Uh, they paid, by the way, $1,100 for the Grand Prairie Battlefield. Um, they intended to make the mansion there in a museum, and they reported uh, at the time that there was grape shot and many balls uh, were plowed up in great quantities all over the fields there. So it's important to recall the Civil War is very much on the minds of, of the Southern Doughboy, or at least his supporters. The question in his mind, and the question in the mind of the, of the family sending their son away, was would they live up to the image of this Confederate grit? Would they be as v valorous as their Confederate forefathers? That sounds like a silly question. But if you go back and look at the discussion at the time, this was really a part of this. One thing that's important to remember that Wilson is the first Southern president elected to the office since Zachary Taylor. The Southern Democrats sweep into Washington. Wilson is a historian. So he staffed his administration with Southern Democrats. His election was perceived by Southerners as an effort at national reconciliation, or at least they hoped it would be. Wilson's election laid the groundwork for making it a modern nation state as we know it, because he brought together these regional divisions that hadn't been uh, on good terms up until his presidency, you might say. Many parts of the South struggled to build a modern economy, and Wilson uh, and others worried that the nation would be weakened by the backward economic regions of the South. So Wilson went about trying to, to fix the South's economic problems. He wrote a book called New Freedom. It's titled in 1913. The, the focus of these freedoms was on limited government, lower tariffs, more equitable bank loans, especially for farmers, 
and on business reform and regulation aimed at protecting consumers. One statistic will describe what the war did more than anything else in Arkansas. In 1896, cotton, Arkansas's number one agricultural product, was just six cents a pound. In 1910, 15.1 cents. In 1917, 23.5 cents. And in 1920, it peaked at 33.9 cents a pound. So the price of cotton skyrocketed. And for the average Arkansan living in the rural Arkansas, picking cotton day by day, this was an incredible boom. Wilson also brought in the national politics his southern outlook on race by instituting segregation in the military, including removing black Navy petty officers from their long-held positions as gunners and relegating them to jobs as cooks and stewards. Nationally, the greatest effort at this racial reconciliation, and I say that in quotes, came in June 4, 1914, 106 years after the birth of Jefferson Davis, when a monument to the Confederacy was erected in Arlington National Cemetery with President Wilson in attendance. Pictures here of this reconciliation movement that's going on during the war. Okay. You can see here, this is at the angle at Gettysburg, Confederates and Union shaking hands. There's Wilson speaking in Gettysburg. Get to this one in a minute. Actually, let me go on. Here's the, I've got this picture. This is the Arlington National Cemetery Monument. Wilson goes and gives remarks. The Grand Army of the Republic was there as well as the Sons of Confederate Veterans. And Wilson uh, and his war were popular among the aging Confederate troops. Their fag flagship publication, The Confederate Veteran, which ran from 1893 to 1932, often published articles in support of the war. 1918, the pronouncement was a boisterous endorsement of President Wilson and his administration. The United Confederate Veterans Association, in convention assembled, desires to go on record before the world with reference to the great world war our country now is engaged in as a heart and soul back of the Washington administration and 100% loyal to the colors. It was really the first time that the Confederate veterans had been fully on board with endorsing the red, white, and blue in a long time. By the way, you can find a really good run of these online. There's a lot of good information out there about this period and how this particular view goes into it. I was pleasantly pleased. Governor Charles Hillman Bro of Arkansas spoke at the convention, 1918. The salty old soldiers huzzahed his comments and then said, if those boys in the Army can't do it, call on us. 70-year-old soldiers fighting the, the Germans. A little comedy there. Reverend J.H. McNeely, uh, writing in The Confederate Veteran, appealed for support of the war with a uniquely Southern twist. I want to read his comments so you kind of get an idea how the Confederate veterans uh, and their supporters view this. So these, in these days of tragic import, with the world at war, and men's highest ideals of justice, mercy, and truth threatened with utter overthrow, our sons are suddenly called upon to defend those ideals even unto death on the field of battle. In such a time, the thoughts of the people are naturally and properly taken up with the urgent interests of the present to the exclusion of the things of the past, however glorious they may be. In such a time, the thoughts of the people... Well, I'm repeating myself there. Um, and yet the past, with its memorable deeds, its patient sacrifices, its thrilling heroisms, sends forth the most inspiring call, the mightiest influence, to stir the souls of succeeding generations to high and noble endeavor. And when a people become forgetful, here's the, ki the kicker, when a people become forgetful or indifferent to the grand spiritual forces and achievements of the past, that people, that people has become sordid, selfish, degenerate, and incapable of great things. It is almost the only thing that can be said in favor of war, that it arouses men from the lusts of flesh and sense and shows them things worth dying for. Every true American soldier should go into this war resolved to keep untarnished the name and fame of his ancestry by his own worthy deeds. This is especially true of those who are heirs to the traditions of the Confederate soldiers of 1861 and 65, in whose veins flow the bloods of the men and women of that heroic period, and all the more because of the malignant and persistent efforts to misrepresent and dishonor the memory of those who stood for four years of dreadful conflict 
for their constitutional rights, so forth and so on. So the Confederate veterans are saying, you, our sons, must go and fight this great war to fight for the lost cause. Reverend McNeely makes a very important contribution to our understanding of how military service during the Great War was seen during the South. He formulates national military service as a means to honor the valor of Confederate veterans and as a way to defend the lost cause. This is not to say that every single Arkansas doughboy ascribed to this thinking, but rather that some probably did, and that some around them, if not many, thought as Reverend uh, J.H. McGalley did. In addition, we see how the reunion of the North and the South at Gettysburg in 1913 was still an ongoing project in 1917. It's complex, and it had a, 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 a slant to it that was both surrender and intellectual combat. Vital fighting front of using the Great War as a means for the battle of the lost cause was not in the hands of the United Confederate Veterans alone. The UDC, the United Daughters of Confederacy, also fought namely in conducting war relief work. Miss Mary B. Poppenheim, President General of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, urged her membership that the hour for present day patriotism has struck and the UDC have their opportunity to show they are worthy daughters of the men and women of the 60s. And the 60s, she means the 1860s. In this crisis, our country's national life, we must give our best and be worthy of our Confederate lineage. Everything's about the lost cause, if you read this enough, okay? Poppenheim reminded the ladies that our, all our energies and sympathies in behalf of the youth of America who are giving up their all at the country's call will be directed, systematized, and recorded at UDC work. One project which had passed at the National UDC Conference was the plan for the various state um, divisions to pay for beds in hospitals uh, in France. They were to collect funds uh, and buy beds and ambulance equipment, and she says, and have ready to be used when the General Committee shall be able to give you definite and authentic information as to how to best use those funds. Every cantonment community knows the opportunities they have for women's organized help in providing cheer and comfort for the young national soldiers temporarily in their midst. When they purchase the beds, the UDC requirement was that they put a, a plaque at the end of the bed in memoriam too, and then they decided, each division decided which Confederate hero it would be in memoriam to. So you could very well be laying in a, in a bed recuperating from your wounds in France, and the bed is dedicated to Jefferson Davis. The UDC in Arkansas was busy. They bought Liberty Bonds, they handed out Bibles to hometown troops, they pinned medals on returning soldiers at Fort Roots. The Arkansas Division of the UDC also supported a bed in the American Hospital in France, and their chosen leader was Patrick R. Claiborne, as they called him the Stonewall of the West, and added in that we hope our boys have a leader like Claiborne. Reporting on the work in 1917 in support of the war, the Arkansas branch of the UDC declared, who will say the daughters have not been loyal to their oath to President Wilson. While the United Confederate Veterans and the UDC used their organization to, um, and identity to fight for the lost cause by supporting the war effort, uh, aiding and recruiting, providing war relief, the Sons of Confederate Veterans were also active. They believed their greatest contribution was in education, namely education about the U.S. government. And so they organized under the auspices of the Chautauqua Talks, if you're familiar with the Chautauqua Talks, um, a series in which they would simply read, this, this sounds <laughs> uh, very exciting, but they would simply read Supreme Court rulings that supported the Confederate veterans' view. Uh, and then they would place, uh, read some fine Southern poems and have the best musicians in the neighborhood play their Southern songs, and this would suffice for their national service. In many ways, what these organizations were doing was precisely what other civic organizations at the time were doing. Uh, they supported the war effort, as all patriotic Americans were expected to do. However, at every turn, they never missed a chance to buttress to the ideas of the lost cause. Another home front concern was security. The U.S. government passed several laws during the period to clamp down on espionage and enemy propaganda. On April 13, 1917, President Wilson created the Committee 
on public information to promote the war domestically while publicizing American war aims abroad. He used George Creel, who was a muckraking journalist, to run the CPI, and they recruited heavily from business, media, academia, and the art world to sell the war to America. CPI blended uh, all those very sophisticated techniques along with the, with the healthy understanding of human psychology. And its efforts represent the first time a modern government disseminated propaganda on such a large scale. It is fascinating that this phenomenon, often linked with totalitarian regimes, emerge in a democratic state. One way to sell the war th through propaganda was to go directly to the people. CPI arranged a cadre of speakers to assail the American people with simple, effective speeches at a variety of venues. And you can see uh, the one on the, uh, on the right there is the Four Minute Men and all of the uh, Little Rock theaters and where they gave their speeches. So what the CPI does is it sends these guys out called the Four Minute Men. The Arkansas State Council of Defense, chaired by Governor Pro, had a, a Four Minute Men Council in every county. And they gave speeches, obviously four minutes, uh, and you, had to, you were trained and then you delivered the speech as they told you. Now I want to give you just a snippet of a Four Minute Men speech. Okay, this was the type of speech that was given all over in Arkansas during this period. Ladies and gentlemen, I have just received information that there is a German spy among us, a German spy watching us. He is around here somewhere reporting upon you and me, sending reports about us to Berlin and telling the Germans just what we are doing with the Liberty Loans. From every section of the country, these spies have been getting reports over to Potsdam, not general reports, but details where the loan is going well and where its success seems weak and what peoples are saying in the community. For the German government is worried about our great loan. Those junkers fear its effects upon the German morale. They're raising a loan this month too. If the American people lend the billions now and all with a hip hooray, it means that America is united and strong. While if we lend our money half-heartedly, America seems weak and autocracy remains strong. Money means everything now. It means quicker victory and therefore less bloodshed. We are in the war and now Americans can have but one opinion and only one wish in the Liberty Loan. Well, I hope these spies are getting the message straight, letting Potsdam know that America is, is hurling back to the autocrats these answers. For treachery here, for attempted treachery in Mexico, treachery everywhere, one billion. For murder of American women and children, one billion more. For broken faith and promise to murder, more Americans, billions, and billions more. And then we will all add, and the world fight for our liberty, our share, billions and billions and billions and endless billions. Do not let the German spy hear and report that you are a slacker. Now these were the sort of speeches that were given all over the place. Did it work? Did it work? It sounds really kind of silly, doesn't it? Could it possibly work? And Arkansans in Fort Smith, Mena, and Jonesboro, were, mot were they motivated by such speeches? Indeed they were. Suspicion of the state's German-Americans led to a few isolated incidents of violence and intimidation. In 1917, local government officials arrived at the Subiaco uh, Abbey in Logan County, seeking to destroy the Abbey's radio to prevent the monks there from receiving messages from the Kaiser. In fact, the first military operation of the Arkansas National Guard in World War I was to find and destroy a spy wireless station that had been reported somewhere in the Blue Mountains. After searching the area, they found the station on the highest peak in the Ozarks, Mount Magazine. It was a forgotten and abandoned wooden derrick once used by the Government Geodetic Survey Corps. There was even a battle of sorts between Colonel James, commanding officer of the Arkansas National Guard, and Governor Bro, who wanted to send the troops to Bauxite because a German flag had been seen flowing there by some grape grower. They had their effect. The Four Minute Men had their effect. Outside of winding up the American public with Four Minute Men, the CPI took immediate steps to limit damaging information, and they very carefully screened GI letters. There were voluntary guides for news media about how to comply with the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918. This resulted in a broad compliance with censorship requests. <coughs> 
from Wilson's administration. Newspaper editors, reporters, military officers, everybody was on board with censorship. Um, that said, we have a wealth of information in letters sent back home. If you wrote something that was not going to pass the censors, they either destroyed the letter or they cut it out. But we're fortunate the work of Mike Polson has done uh, on his website, Great War Letters. If you're not familiar with that, uh, uh, Mike really needs a, a, a round of applause for the great work that he did to put those letters out there. And I went through and looked at them. I read as many as I could, did a search through them um, over the summer, and they're great reading to get an idea of what the average soldier um, is uh, thinking about during this. So I want to give you a few uh, letters that we have preserved uh, through this process. Notably, one of the first Arkansans to reach the front was also one of the very first American officers in combat in the Great War. Uh, and this guy is William Heber McLaughlin. This is William Heber McLaughlin here. He was from Lone Oak County. He was a farmer. He was a graduate of the University of Arkansas and would go on to become a state legislator. He was a lieutenant in France in November 1917. And he was wounded uh, basically in his very first battle. Um, he was uh, wounded in the head, uh, hit in the head with, by shrapnel that penetrated his helmet uh, during an attack. The attack happened in the early morning hours of November 3rd, 1917. It was the first German attack on American infantry in the war. They had just moved into their positions. This was a night raid. Uh, they were trench raiders and their job was to cross no man's land, infiltrate into the trenches, and capture uh, American soldiers. This was how you acquired intelligence in those days. And it uh, just happened to be that McLaughlin is in charge of a platoon with the sixth, uh, 16th Infantry Regiment that happens to be the focus of one of these attacks. It was 300 Germans um, focusing on one narrow area of the trenches and then they, they used their artillery as a barrage to cut off any reinforcements. So it ends up being 300 Germans versus 30 American soldiers, okay? So McLaughlin is hit in the head probably right at the beginning as far as we can tell. Uh, and the first three Americans that die in World War I die under his command in that platoon, uh, F Company of uh, the six, uh, 16th Infantry Regiment. That's the 1st Infantry Division. <clears throat> this is a monument. Uh, in Lorraine, France, the, the French maintain this of the first three Americans that died. And so Arkansas has a neat link to this first, this first battle. First three Americans that died in the war were Private Merle Hay, uh, Corporal James Gresham, and Thomas Enright. Uh, Gresham was shot in the head and, and nearly beheaded by a German knife. Uh, so probably one of the first uh, people that was, was killed in that battle. Five more were wounded, including McLaughlin, Eleven were taken prisoner, a whole American squad was captured by the Germans and um, uh, taken back to German lines. McLaughlin, in Mike Polson's letters, writes back home. This is a letter to his mother. And he says, save all the papers about the first fight between the Americans and the Germans. It is my platoon that mixed it up. My men are raring to go at them again, but I don't think there's a chance for a long, long time. You see, in a war like this, this is everybody has to have a chance. And when there are so many, it is an awful long line between turns. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I don't know what the American press is saying about it, but don't worry. We did wonderfully well when you consider the fact that they outnumbered us six to one. Okay, so that's McLaughlin's own letter home to his mother about being the first in combat. Several other uh, letters here. <clears throat> uh, Lieutenant Grady. H. Forgey of Mina wrote home in September 1918. His letter is very common. They try to put a positive spin on it. He says, I'm now in a very nice place, about the best I've been in France, one of the large base hospitals. That's not the letter you want to get from your kid, right? In a very quaint and peaceful part of this country. I have a real bed to sleep on, and it sure has nice white sheets. We have the best food, and all the doctors and nurses and attendants do everything possible for the patients. Why am I here? This is what he's writing to his mother. Why am I here? Well, you see, I got mixed up with a Boss shell, several of them, in fact, and I got hit on the left shin. It was just a small wound, but I got a pretty bad case of shell shock. That was on July 31st. He's writing in September, so he really never makes it back to the line. He says, we know, we know now that the Hun is nothing to fear. He is yellow and too low to let live. 
He will absolutely not fight hand to hand, and all of our wounded uh, have not heard of a single man being hurt by a Bosch bayonet. It was all machine guns and artillery that we ran into. My regiment had Prussian guards in front of us, and they are Germany's best, best but they are yellow too. They say all the Americans are devil dogs and they hate us, but there's no love lost. Private Homer Grisham wrote home uh, to Judd Sonia from a military hospital in September, uh, September, 18th, September 18th, 1918. He says, I am I am well, I only have lost two of my fingers. Only have lost two of my fingers. I was up at the big front helping run the Huns, and, and they sent me a shell I could not dodge. Uh, but I got plenty of them to pay for my fingers anyway. Bill Wagoner of uh, Lone Oak County was uh, elected to the Arkansas House of Representatives uh, in the 1915 term. Uh, and he served temporary, uh, temporarily as the Speaker of the House. Then he resigned his, his position and took a commission in the Arkansas um, uh, National Guard, became a second lieutenant in the Army, and left. Um, he uh, is one of the few that I found that had any kind of reference to the Confederacy. Uh, and he, he invokes General Sherman in his view of what he saw in the war. said, I never knew what war was like until I took part in this great battle. Sherman shouldn't have used such mild terms in describing it when he said war is hell. For in his day, they never used gas, machine guns, trench mortars, high explosive hand grenades, rifle grenades, tanks, airplanes filled with bombs, and every imaginable thing to destroy human life. If they had, he would have used different language in describing the war. So Bill Wagner, Speaker of the House in Arkansas. <clears throat> Herman Lane... Um, writing about his experiences, I was impressed from the beginning by the, by the splendid manhood assembled here in his camp. They are a lively, well-appearing, working bunch of men and represent the pick of the entire South. I can't describe what a mighty fighting force they would make if they remained in the respective companies of private soldiers. And uh, he goes on to say, one must see in order to comprehend the possibilities that lie in easy reach of our country. One of the recurrent themes uh, that you see in these letters is how each of these men uh, grew from their military experience. They saw the world in a different way. Uh, Glenn Cole um, um, is riding back home, and he, he's at uh, uh, Salt St. Serene, Michigan, which you've described as a nice little place, but awful cold, colder than it ever gets in Arkansas. He was amazed by the Sioux Locks, which connect Lake Superior to the Great Lakes. They are one of the most active waterways in the world. And he writes, you'd be amazed at the stupendousness of the shipping which passes through the locks. I was on guard last night and counted 115 ships, any one of which could carry Judsonia away in one load. <laughs> Cole felt <clears throat> that he was doing his hardest bit as a soldier, walking a lonesome post in the most severe climate on earth. And he said, I believe I would like, as many others would, to be in the front line in the, in the trenches in France but I'm glad to do some real soldiering soon. So I just wanted to give you <clears throat> something of an impression of what the soldier's experience was. Uh, give you one last one, and, and, and uh, I want you to listen to what he has to say, because I think we're beginning to see it, in this war a change. This is L. A. Gerard of DeWitt. That's how much time I got here. I got enough time. <clears throat> he was at Camp Jackson in South Carolina. Uh, he worked at a training depot, so he trained men equipped them and sent them over, and then they came back. And he said, I'm glad to know that the men who went across came back with a smile on their faces, and they said that the Germans were not too hard to whip, after all, that it's not <clears throat> so hard to go over the top as many people think. And here he says, and for, forgive the language, but this is the language they used. He says, the Negroes are coming back also, and we can give them the same honor as the others, because they did their part in this war. There are several in the hospital here now with three wound stripes on their sleeves, and they are proud of them. I think all have done their part in this terrible war, black and white, with or without uniforms, and that we, are, we too are proud of the fact that we are living under the stars and stripes. It's a remarkable observation from a guy from DeWitt. His observation points to something else. 18,000 black veterans came back to Arkansas after the Great War. Due to the segregated nature of the Army, 
the Army only used 40,000 men in combat units, black men in combat units. 160,000 were used in labor units, and that's all too common. None of the uh, black soldiers were allowed to serve in the National Guard. There were a few opportunities, however, for black troops. One includes Douglas Robinson of Clarendon, who was the first black Arkansan commissioned as a second lieutenant uh, during the war. Let me pause on this very quickly, get to my slides. This is a, a poster of the first three McLaughlin's men. Uh, this is a doughboy in his, his accoutrements. And on the other end is a German trench raider. Okay? They had no idea how medieval the war had, the war had turned. Okay? You got a, basically a knight in shining armor with you know, a mace. A uh, very different sort of experience uh, than they expected. But uh, Douglas Robinson and many uh, black Arkansans served in the war. Here's one, Private William Brown of Helena. says, I am awful proud that I came over to France to serve my country for now. For now that we have gone over the top, we can go home with our chest stuck out like a peacock. <clears throat> Kleine Trammell from Magnolia wrote back, We are here to do our best. We have valiant soldiers who do not fear to die. This is from the black troops that are fighting. Black citizens worked hard to contribute to the war effort. The Mosaic Templars of Arkansas donated 100000 in Liberty Bonds. It's a tremendous amount of money in those days. 50000 of that was given by Scipio Jones, a lawyer in Little Rock, to the Secretary of the Treasury, William Gibbs McAdoo, when he visited Arkansas in 1917. <clears throat> At the same time, you have the inauguration of NAACP chapters in Little Rock and Fort Smith in 1918 and 1919. Things were kind of looking up for black Arkansans because of the war. However, in 1919, you have the Lane Race Riot. That breaks out. A large number of blacks are killed in Phillips County. I looked it up. There were 1,700 black draftees in Phillips County during the War of War. And when the U.S. Army went in and stopped the, the killing, um, at the end of this thing, their report said that these were veterans that were fighting. Black veterans went back and used their army experience uh, to fight for their own freedom. <clears throat> Arkansas's experience during the Great War cannot be easily summarized in a talk like this. <clears throat> I've not talked about the economy much at all. I've not talked about our major war heroes, um, such as Herman uh, Davis. I didn't discuss the facilities like Camp Pike. What I've tried to do is give some new original information uh, in a talk like this about the basic activities of the people as they thought about the war. Uh, I've tried to quote as much as possible from their words uh, to present that to you uh, today. So I've got a little bit of time left, four minutes. If anybody has any questions, comments. Yes. There were some Americans who almost from the first were overseas to observe. Yes. Yes. Did any of them make it to Arkansas after the U.S. declared war to give, whether it was training or in any way, a more realistic picture of what um, combat was like? I, I don't know. I do know that we had uh, uh, people who, who did go to the war and come back from, from the Army uh, at the lower list, enlisted level. Uh, but I do know that also when they arrived in France, the French basically said, you're not anywhere close to ready. And it took uh, approximately six months from first arrival before they were willing to put troops uh, on the ground. And in fact, in Laughlin's case, they let them go in for 10 days and then they pulled them out and they rotated the whole regiment through. You only got 10 days and it just happened to be the very moment they sat in their trenches, they got attacked. Uh, by the Germans uh, on, on November 3rd. So they just weren't ready. They just had no idea the, the level of uh, desperation that the Germans were at at that time. So, yes, sir? Yeah, divisional control. They didn't want to split up uh, control American force. The only ones they were willing to do 
were African American units. They would gave those to the French, but that was the exception. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much.